Hi everybody, I'm Sabine from the Wine Collective, the senior wine buyer, and we are lucky enough to have Jeff Merrill from Jeff Merrill Wines with us. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well, I'm at home. Where are you? Are you at the winery? I'm at the winery in our tasting room, which oh. is um, in the production area of the winery. Very good. And it looks like some of those wines have already been opened. Have you already been drinking, Jeff? No, Chris has <laughs> so. I mean, I, he's a closet drinker. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you've been making wine in the McLaren Vale since the early 70s, which is amazing to see. You must have seen a lot of change that's happened to the area, I guess, just with the way of how things are made, um, I guess, just like the, the way that you're doing viticulture, the way that you're actually producing wines. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I started in the Barossa um, as a trainee with Sepulx in 1970. I got accepted to Rosalie at the same time, but Sepulx had a, a trainee program. Then I went to work in South Africa when I finished at the Institute of Tech with Sepulx and uh, I went to work for Stenlos Farmers Winery and I came back here in 1975 and worked for Shadow Ranella. Now Ranella was an amazing winery. Um, it was owned by Rothmans at the time. Yeah. But it had people, they had 13 people at Shadow Ranella that had done 50 years of service. Um, you know, there were 12 men and one woman. It was, and, and their loyalty stepped back to the depression years. So um, I learned a lot there. I learned about traditional winemaking, as I did with Sepulchs, I must admit. Um, mm -hmm. they, they had quite an ethos, and so did Chatteronella. It, it was an infancy of the industry in the Crown Bar when I first started. And there were some great young people that <clears throat> were involved in... in making the district better. There was more of a cottage industry apart from Rennell's and Hardy's and Seaview. Um, there were, you know, there weren't, Darrenberg was around, K Brothers were there, but you know, there, there was a lot of small people starting up. There was a, it was a big viticultural area, but not necessarily a big one. And the likes of Brian Walsh and, and Pam Dunsford, myself, uh, Tim James, um, there was a lot of innovative young people. We, we had a license to do whatever we like. We we're only 24 to, you know, all under 30 and all complete, you know, piss head rat bags, really. And, uh, but because of that, a lot of really good things happened. And I think through the, the, the local wine show and that, we, our, our brief was to improve the quality of, of the local wines. And now, you know, there's now 60-odd wineries in McLaren Vale and each of them have got an individual flair. Um, each of them do things a little bit differently, but it all comes back to the quality of fruit that's available out of McLaren Vale. And I think with varieties like Grenache and, and Shiraz, that um, they are, without a doubt, some of the best in the world. Um, McLaren Vale Shiraz easily makes some of the best Shiraz in the world. And... Um, um, the Barossa for years before, you know, 1975, the Barossa for years used to buy a lot of the local fruit um, and always brand it basically Barossa, but uh, as did big parts of the country. But now everyone proudly um, uh, brands their wines um, at Crown Vale and rightly so. Yeah, I think it's, well, we have a big customer base and a lot of them love South Australia in general. A lot of them love McLaren Vale, especially for the, as you said, the Grenache and the Shiraz and the same thing with the Brossa. They're, they're very different, they're very unique, but what you guys do is, is amazing. And the fact that you have so much age on your wines as well. I was actually thinking about this this morning. You're, you release your wines at an age where they're ready to drink. You've done the cellaring already for the customers. And with your, like the Pimpala and the Greymore, their, your current release is older than my eldest child. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I'm a bit of a fossil myself. But, a lot um, of patience, though, waiting that time and getting it ready and then going, okay, it's ready to release. Well, I think it's important. And I've, and I've sort of been an advocate and a bit, um, a bit vocal about young red wines. I'm, I'm not the, a massive fan of red wines that are not designed to to be made as young wines. You know, I think with the tannin structures and the acids and pHs in a lot of red wine, it needs time. And if you're making it for longevity, but you're selling it as a one-year-old or two-year-old wine, the, the wines aren't together. They, 
the tannins are one side of the room and the and the other flavours the other side of the room. It needs time to in bottle or in barrel first and then in bottle second yeah, to, to, um, together, to integrate to come together to be a harmony of strength. And I love drinking wines with age on them. I've got a wine at home um, that I'm going to drink on Saturday. Not, not tonight. No, no, with some of my golf mates. But that's a 19, that was a wine that I made uh, in the late 70s. And yeah. so it's 40 odd years of age and it'll drink beautifully. There's yeah. no doubt about it. I mean, we underestimate in this country just how well Australian wines age. Yeah. They are magnificent. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I have a confession to make. I absolutely hate sport of any <laughs> kind. <laughs> of any kind and I'm really quite mean because my husband loves sport and I really can't stand when it's on so I know that you have all those beautiful bottles of wines behind you with cricket references yeah I would love to know what's the obsession what does it mean I call that Chardonnay that you have right there the BMW but really I know it has some sort of significance or some sort of well, with, uh... I mean I, I was um I always wanted to be a you know uh a rock and roll star, and I was, you know, I, I, I drove my mother mad with the drum set that I had, I bloody bang everything together. So I was, a, I was an incompetent rock and roll star, even though I sing a mean set of blues. Um, but, um, but I was also a relatively incompetent cricketer. So my father, I remember, took me as a 12 year old to Adelaide Oval, and um, I think something like 15 wickets fell that day and I didn't see any of them because I was running around like a loose goose. But um, over the years, through drink, and uh, drink has um, helped me meet a lot of amazing people in their field, whether they be sportsmen or sportsmen and women and um, uh, rock stars. I've met lots of people through, through my job. And the interesting thing is that... Um, they think that my job is uh, a wonderful thing because they love drinking and I love watching them play sport or I love watching them play yeah. music. Uh, and these two guys I met in uh, 1978, Bob Willis, who recently passed away, and um, Ian Botham, uh, two of the biggest uh, names in English cricket. Um, and so, you know, we just got together over a drink and then a lifelong friendship evolved over a drink um so Pretty you know you don't have to you don't have to love sport to get a lot out of it so you're a drinker so you could actually join your husband uh and uh drink with him and watch sport <laughs> and maybe fall asleep at the end too <laughs> oh, whatever doesn't matter <laughs> so that's where the both of Meryl Willis comes from I mean the, yeah. the legend of that is that the Bavarian Motor Works, which is, is the BMW side of it, said to BP um, they were going to sue us for abbreviating um, oh, wow. both of Merrill Willis in the BMW. And uh, BP said, well, we promise not to make cars if you promise not to make wine. So that's how that came about. And, and we haven't uh, ever since. But I, I remember Gene Simmons um, from um, Kiss and... Um, they wanted me to make wine. They approached me to make wine for them under his label. And then he wanted to charge me 125,000 US royalty. I said, sorry, Jane, I'm not interested. <laughs> but that was, um, there's a lot of celebrity, there's a lot of celebrity wines around the place. But the, the key to our celebrity wines is that they've got to taste bloody good because people do line them up and people do make sure that um, they stand up against um, all sorts of qualities. And, and because they, they generally made, you know, have the superstar's name on the label, that they come under greater scrutiny, I that's think. That's right. Yeah. That's so, right. Um, yeah, that's where we're at with, yeah. with that. Yeah. Uh, Elsa, you're working on something special for us, I believe. I think we're going to be getting it in the next few weeks. I think it's the um, Mount Hurtle 2014... New sure that's, that's coming through. That's right. Yeah. Well, we, well, Mount Hurdle is the name of this winery, of course, and um, it's uh, a, we've done a barrel selection for you of our, our best Shiraz out of fourteen, um, and uh, so that's on its way to you. And it's typical 
um, the caramel shiraz, you know, that white pepper licorice characters, which I love. I mean, there's so many descriptors for shiraz. There's probably 90 of them. And the problem is that you, unless you use the right descriptor, you, it's hard for people to get the flavour threshold. Not, I like simple descriptors, which licorice we all understand. We all understand white pepper. We all understand aniseed. And that's very typical of McLaren Bar. Less typical of Barossa, I might add. Um, and, um, but a lot of Victorian, the granite belt gets a lot of white pepper, which I, I just love in, in Shiraz and in Grenache. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's going to be a cracking one. And, yeah, uh, I think it's it's coming to us toward the end of this month, which will be really exciting. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. Um, it's on its way. It's four weeks. Yeah. Very go very soon. And I have another question that I've been meaning to ask you. So this lovely um, mushroom and beer that you have happening is this is this something that's grown even further along whilst we've been in isolation? Uh, well, the moustache had a serious trim. In two thousand and one, yes. I mean, my moustache was. I've seen photos of what it used to look like. Oh, well, my moustache was massive, um, and it all started from a bet with some mates of mine. In fact, David Brown, who owns Miller with Cheese, uh, <laughs> Brownie used to work with me at, at uh, Chatteranella. You know, he used to come and do a vintage each year, and uh, and uh, Brownie's got a a very opulent red moustache. Ah. So we all had these bets that we could. Uh, grow bigger moustaches than each other. And in the end, my moustache took over my whole whole identity, my face, my <laughs> identity, everything, you know. And uh, in fact, people would write more about my moustache than they would write about my wine. It's, it's but, actually um, a bit of a thing to say, though. When you talk, talk to people, they say, oh, Jeff Merrill. They're like, oh, he's the guy, yeah, the facial hair, the moustache. It's exactly... Yeah, but it's not there anymore. In fact, when I, had, when I cut it all off, my mates said, what have you done to your teeth? Well, I haven't done anything with my teeth. I've always looked after my teeth, but they could never see them because my moustache covered them. But this beard's come of COVID, um, and I was about to shave one day we were going out, and my wife said to me, why don't you grow a beard? And uh, I haven't had a beard since I was 21, so I thought, okay, I might as well do that. And um, I did it, and I don't mind the effect. I've been growing my hair... So I can look like, I've always wanted to look like a vagrant and I think I've achieved it. Um, so um, that's, that's, the, that's it. I'll, I'll get arrested for standing around the corner shortly. <laughs> I'm an old man getting older and, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't look that prosperous really. The reason why I ask is because we've, we've obviously been working remotely from home and every time we have any Zoom meetings, whenever we see any of the men, they've all got these amazing bits of beard and facial yeah. hair. just incredible half the time we're talking to people and i'm like oh i didn't know that you had red hair or like it's quite interesting when you see all of this i oh, know it's um it's good though I, I mean i i actually had a shave this morning so but not that you'd be able to tell on on uh, this uh, camera but it's it's i quite like it and i went and bought all the gadgets that go oh, with it wow. you know, so that you can keep it trimmed and yeah, it's a bit of a laugh, really. I don't know how long it'll last. Every time I think I'll shave it off, I think, no, I don't mind it. So keep I'm not sure about the hair anymore because there's a fairly large bald patch in the middle. But Surely it's keeping you I'll alive. do the old comb over eventually. <laughs> That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the last question I have is just about, um, I guess you sort of answered it along the way, but I'm just thinking about... Um, is there some sort of like secret recipe or trick that you do when you're making your wines? Because they're just, besides the fact that you're aging them to perfection, our customers just can't get enough. It's like there's just every time you just check it off and go, tick, secret sauce done, next wine. Oh, that's good. Well, look, I, I don't ever think there's any magic in wine making. I've just have always been taught from a very young age that, that the, the great instrument of wine making is, is, um, attention to detail, making sure that your tanks are all full, making sure that you pick your fruit, or well, primarily you pick your fruit when it's physiologically right and you look after it when it comes into the winery. So when, when any batch of fruit comes in the winery, we say we're going to make gold metal wine out of it. Now that doesn't always happen, but if you approach every batch of wine that you make to say that you're going to make gold medal or trophy winning wine out of it, then everything is treated equally and it's treated really well. And then from there that you do your culling process and you and 
not everything is made gold medal wine, but at least you've given it a try. And um, and we we uh, you know do call it ferments and most, um, and we just you know we just have a we don't do anything by recipe by but other than when we know that the fruit flavours are in the vineyard, then we pick the then we pick that batch of wine, and we pick in ten ton batches so that we've got a you know, so we pick a, pick rows up into 10 tonnes and we know what rows we pick. And we can come back over a great historical uh, database that we've got to know just how each particular area of the vineyard has, has uh, performed. But then I, I've always maintained, at vintage time, you haven't got time to finesse too much. You've got to be, you've got to look at the fruit, make sure you have got time in the vineyard to finesse, but once it's in the winery, you haven't got a lot of time to finesse. Oh, yeah. It is afterwards, when the wines are one and two years of age, that's the important time. When you decide which barrel is going to go where, that's the important time. So tasting, which Scott and I do together, um, you know, we're, we're about to do all the 2019s. We haven't classified them yet. Yeah, well, um, so we're going to classify the 2019s in August when this room gets a bit bloody warmer. Um, and, and, and that's a critical time for those wines and for us. So it's all about attention to detail. Wow, that's great. All right, well, I better let you carry on with your day. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Jeff, and thanks to the viewers for watching. Yeah, my pleasure. We look forward to seeing the Mount Hurdle and the rest of the range. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, you too. Nice to meet you. You too. Stay bye safe. Bye. 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 bye.